now move to question time. Ask questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. And we start with topical questions. And I call Mitchell McLaughlin. You leave this out for me. <laughs> uh, hello, Minister. Good afternoon. Uh, you're probably aware, Minister, that civil servants in uh, Waterside House in Derry uh, have been uh, distressed to learn of plans to uh, outsource their jobs and that uh, you may be making uh, a statement on this matter in the near future. Uh, could you explain just why uh, you know, this developed almost under the radar? Uh, I'm sure you weren't trying to keep it a secret. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome the member to the House? <laughs> very time, timely arrival, very efficient arrival to the House. Um, take, take exception with one of the, the, the terms that the member has used, that, um, that this has happened under the radar. Um, trade union staff in Waterside House and our civil servants pensions branch, which is based in Londonderry, have been consulted uh, throughout this process. Um, the, he also used the, the, the phrase in term outsourcing the work that they do. And I think this, this gives me a, a useful opportunity, as indeed will, I'm sure, uh, an adjournment debate on public sector jobs in the North West later on this evening to clarify a few points which I think have been uh, whipped up for some particular purpose by some ill-informed um, public comment on this topic. I can understand the concerns that staff in pensions branch might have whenever I would read, if I was one of them and I was reading some of the comments, that 80 jobs in their branch could be made redundant because of uh, the outsourcing of the work that they do. Let me make it clear to the member, let me make it clear to the House that the work that we are doing in terms of a future uh, delivery project, service delivery project, comes out of necessity. The IT systems that we have that pay and administer pensions are running two separate IT systems at the minute and they are coming to the end of their life. And whilst it's not a, a determinative factor, it is an issue where pension reform across the water is necessitating that we streamline what we do. So we are having to procure one new uh, uh, IT system to pay and administer pensions. Um, I am duty bound, I believe, to um, provide the best service that I possibly can for everybody in Northern Ireland and do so in a value for money way. And I think I would be remiss in my duties, and the member would perhaps be the first to attack me if, in seeking solutions for the future delivery of pensions in Northern Ireland, I didn't look at all options that were there, including outsourcing, if indeed that pro provides the best value for money and indeed the best service and the best outcomes. Mr McLaughlin. And, uh, I thank the, uh, the Minister and I assure him, while I might criticise him, I will not attack him. Uh, he and I have uh, done some useful work over the years on the Finance Committee. I have to say, it came as a bit of a surprise to members of the Finance Committee. Uh, I have spoken to uh, some of those very civil servants in Derry, and it's they. It's not somebody whipping it up who are seriously concerned. Can the Minister indicate if outsourcing is one of the options that uh, is in this mix, will it affect the wider civil service as well as an option? I, I have no. Let me, let me make this point. I have no ideological problem with any form of service delivery model, whether that be doing it in-house, uh, a joint venture with the private sector, outsourcing it to perhaps the private sector or the third sector, the voluntary and community sector. I have no sort of dogma that drives me in one particular way or in the other. The only ideology and the only dogma that drives me in respect of this, Mr Speaker, is getting the best service that provides the best outcome for the people who elect us to serve them. Uh, in respect of the staff in Waterside House, I can understand the concerns that they would have, but let me make, let me make this clear, that they have been informed uh, throughout this process that because of the necessity to produce a new IT system, there will be a requirement to have less staff. No matter what option is chosen, there will be a requirement to have less staff in Waterside House. But let me make this clear as well, that no matter what outcome is chosen, no matter what the uh, outlined business case uh, suggests the direction in which we head in this matter, um, there will still be a necessity for a pensions branch because there will be you know, high-level work, particularly in terms of policy, in terms of financial accounting and other areas, which will still be required, and those people will be civil servants. Anybody, and there will be some people who will not be required uh, in pensions branch in the future, they will not be made redundant, and they will be moved around the systems in a, system in accordance with uh, custom and practice uh, within the civil service. So those who are, Mr Speaker, publicly saying that 80 
civil servants will be made redundant are wrong in their numbers, and they are wrong even to say that those people will be made redundant. And I hope that I can give today and perhaps later in the debate some assurance to those people that the concerns that have been whipped up by some public comment are not valid. Can I ask the Minister if his department has any plans to increase the number of staff using more sustainable transport? And I'm thinking really about the amount of money that is spent on car parking spaces in the Belfast area for staff each year by executive departments. I appreciate that there is a, a desire right across society to try to be more sustainable and more environmentally friendly in our use of transport. I think by necessity the civil service, particularly uh, my department is in, its, in its stewardship of, of all properties across the civil service, will have um, a number of properties that have car parking spaces with it, but he will be aware of many schemes that we uh, run within the civil service, including uh, cycle to work schemes and, and, and um, car sharing initiatives that the Minister for Regional Development will be responsible, responsible for that uh, encourage civil servants, public servants right across the board to be uh, more considerate about the use of transport, the, the, the choice of transport, the mode of transport that they would choose to use. Um, but we have to accept in some cases, in many cases in fact, uh, using motor vehicles to get to their place of work is the best and only option available to people. Mr. Michael Mr. Michael uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Can I suggest to the Minister that if we had a very serious approach to decentralisation of public sector jobs to towns like Oma, that uh, that is one way of reducing such costs and such numbers of car parking spaces? And really, what I am asking the Minister is, are we serious? about relocation of public sector jobs, decentralisation, or are we merely paying lip service to it? Well, the member will be, will be well aware that his uh, party colleague, the Minister of Agriculture, does intend to decentralise headquarters jobs from the Department of Agriculture to Ballykelly. I think that would be something that I am sure the, the member would welcome. Um, the town of Oma, which he is obviously very fond of, given that he lives there and represents it, does have one of the highest levels per thousand or per hundred thousand of the working population uh, of people working within the public sector. Uh, so in that respect, there has been uh, decentralisation of jobs to that area. I don't accept, though, that the argument that if we were to take all of our government departments and put them all out to provincial towns, that suddenly we would see the end of people driving into work. My experience in Northern Ireland is that people will drive even very, very short distances to work. So in that respect, there will still be a need for car parking spaces, whether the headquarters or the agency is, the, is in Oma or in Belfast or Newton or wherever it might be. Alwyn McGuinness. Mr. McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, uh, last week, um, the RBS announced a review into the Ulster Bank and its operations here in Northern Ireland, the RBS being the parent bank and also being state-owned. Uh, has the Minister any concerns in relation to that review, and has the Minister sought a meeting with RBS to discuss the review? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for, for his question. Um, it is a, I think I would have been more concerned at the outcome uh, of the announcement had it have been the decision that had been taken by the government in conjunction with RBS had have been one of those options that were very publicly being talked about, which was something along the lines of, of Ulster Bank, which we know to, to have been a, a serious problem within the RBS group and for the RBS group, and indeed much of the detail contained behind the report. Um, does show the extent to which Ulster Bank is a problem within the group. I think we would have been more worrying today, and more, uh, had more cause to be concerned today, if the option of creating the Ulster Bank and hiving the Ulster Bank off and all of its assets, whether good or bad, and establishing it as a bad bank either internally within the group or outside of the group, I think we would have had more concern to be worried then. So in that respect, I welcome the fact that a decision has been taken by the Treasury to retain the Ulster Bank as a core part of RBS's operations. And I think given, as the member has acknowledged, the, the fact that it is our biggest lending bank, it is over 30 per cent of the market, it, it is the only sort of nationally owned bank and therefore is very often the only bank that takes forward national, le national lending initiatives like funding for lending in Northern Ireland and export finance guarantee scheme in Northern Ireland, it's essential that we have an Ulster Bank here that is functioning properly. Uh, that has been recognised by Treasury. Do I have concerns? Absolutely. There are, there are areas in the report that do cause concern. The review, the second review into uh, establishing the Ulster Bank on a long-term and sustainable footing, I, I think is, is code for further restructuring of that bank. 
I think it is probably inevitable that there will be further job losses, Mr. Speaker, in respect of Ulster Bank, as indeed there probably will be across other banks before they get to the position where they are properly functioning. And I have also some concerns uh, at the time scale for the sale of assets of three years, um, which as a member will know, in, in a depressed property market like the one in Northern Ireland we, that we have currently, is cause for concern. Alwyn McGuinness. Um, could I thank the Minister for that answer? And I'm banking uh, the first part of uh, his answer. Uh, it is reassuring uh, in relation to the Treasury's view and RBS's view in relation to the Ulster Bank. However, when I hear the term review, particularly coming from banks, I think I am right to be nervous, given the fact that over the past number of years the banks have butchered uh, branches and staff. And, uh, therefore, I would ask the Minister to have direct contact with RBS and to say to RBS, to finish. Say to RBS no more uh, branch cuts and no more staff cuts. Uh, thank the member again for something. And I was remiss in not uh, addressing the issue of have I met with Ulster Bank. I have spoken with senior management in Ulster Bank. Uh, I am scheduled to meet them next week. Um, following on from that meeting, I would hope to meet with uh, the new chief executive, Ross McEwen, uh, the new chief executive of RBS, uh, because I do think there are points, like the, the points that the member has made, that we need to reiterate and the, the importance of. And I think that the, the, the report gives us that argument to take to RBS and to take to Treasury, that there is an acknowledgement of the importance of Ulster Bank to the Northern Ireland economy. We need the Ulster Bank to be functioning properly because, as a member will know and the House will know, businesses are starting to see signs of recovery, and if they are starting to see signs of recovery, they will be wanting to get the sort of credit that they need to develop their businesses. So in that respect, we need the Ulster Bank to be doing its job, which is lending money to have people who have viable propositions. Um, so I hope to, hope to meet with the Treasury. I hope that we have already spoken to the Treasury again on the telephone. Um, the Joint Ministerial Task Force, which Arlene Foster and I sit on, will, I am sure, concentrate and drill down on this particular issue. In meeting with Ulster Bank as well, I hope to, to, to um, try to influence as best I can this new, new bad bank creation that Northern Ireland's property market isn't the same as London and the South East. Um, flooding our market with uh, assets over a very short three-year period, distinct, of course, from what NAMA are doing, which is taking a much longer view to distressed assets. Doing that over three years could have a very seriously detrimental impact on a property market which is languishing close to the bottom, but is at least showing some, early, some, some signs of some improvement. We don't want to kill that stone dead uh, before it has even started. Prime McCann, Mr. McCann. Well, Amila Malgat, Kian Kolya, Kest, Ever Kahar, question four. Order it. It's, it's topical questions. Sorry. Just ask the question directly to the minister. Uh, as, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Simon on his recent promotion uh, to, to the Minister. Uh, but the, the, uh, say the, there, there has been no doubt there will be serious problems uh, with the recent announcement on APD uh, in the South. Uh, could the Minister uh, tell us uh, what, what, what he is doing uh, as a Minister to try and uh, deal with the, the serious problem that, that could cause in the North? Uh, I thank the Member, Mr. Speaker, for his question. I thank him for his, his congratulations as well. Um, the, the announcement within the uh, Republic of Ireland budget that they would eliminate APD has obviously brought this issue to the forefront of people's minds once again. In itself, I don't think the reduction, the elimination rather, of APD from three euros down to zero will have a massively significant effect on traffic from Northern Ireland's airports down to Dublin Airport. And in fact, that was reflected in public comments made by um, Belfast City Airport after the Irish government's uh, budget announcement. Um, and I think that's, I think that's fairly transparently why it would be the case that you know, three, saving three euros on a flight isn't enough of a justification to pay for the petrol and the toll and so forth to go on the parking um, to go down to Dublin Airport. But I do accept that there is a problem caused and a distortion caused within Northern Ireland by having APD. It is a, a tax that is, is the very definition of an unfair tax because it, it works against regional, regions of the United Kingdom, like Northern Ireland, like Scotland, like some parts of Northern England as well. And in that respect, I would, and I'm sure the member would, would 
echo my concerns and would say to Treasury that it is time that it eliminated APD so that we could have a fair tax situation in Northern Ireland and we could uh, use the elimination of it for all flights, as we've already done for, for long-haul flights ourselves, to encourage more people to operate, more, more airlines to operate out of Northern Ireland and increase and enhance our, our connectivity to the world. Order, Member, that concludes topical questions to the Minister of Finance. We now move to order.